Welcome to all the people here in the room and to those of you watching online. For anyone who may be joining us for the first time here at Cornerstone Church, we dedicate the start of our service to a giving scripture and praying over the offering. Sorry. You can give by scanning the QR code that you see up on the screen or dropping it in either of the lock boxes at the back of the sanctuary. We ask that now that service has started, if you haven't given your offering yet, that you would place it in the lockbox. This month, our giving scripture is from Par Par Bleh? Proverbs 11:25. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And I thank you for every person that was able to give this morning, Lord. And I pray that they will be blessed. Father God, help us to be generous in spirit, not only with our material possessions, but with our time, our love, and our compassion. I pray, Lord, that our acts of kindness and generosity be seed sown in good soil, bearing fruit for your kingdom. As we bring this offering before you this morning, Lord, I pray that you'll bless it and give us the wisdom from your word and by your spirit to know best how to honor and glorify you, Lord, with all that you have given us. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. We have a few announcements. Next Sunday, August 25th, there will be no kids' church for ages 5 to 12, but there will be nursery and we worship. Royal Rangers and Girls Ministry registration has begun today, and you can register by online, or Pastor Amanda has left hard copies out at the check-in table. Mark your calendars. September 29th, we'll be hosting a DLT Crock-Pot Cook-Off. As that day gets closer, we'll have more details for everybody. Next, as you may have heard, Nancy Phelps will be retiring at the end of this month. And we'd love to show her our love and appreciation for her dedication over the past 10 years. We've placed a card basket out in the foyer for anyone who would like to leave cards or small gifts. And last but not least, kids will be dismissed after worship. Please stand for the reading of the word. We'll be reading Psalm 20, verses 6 through 8. Now this I know. The Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of our Lord. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you for your unfailing love and your mighty power. Father God, we acknowledge that our trust is not in the things of this world, but in you alone. When others falter and fall, Lord, you uphold us and empower us to rise and stand firm. Father God, I pray that as we leave this place today, that we would stand firm in your promises and be ready to serve you with all our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless and guide Pastor Jay with wisdom and strength as he guides us according to your will. As we move into service this morning, Lord, I pray that you would incline us to your testimony. Open our eyes to see the wonderful things in all that you do. Unite our hearts to fear your name and satisfy us with your steadfast love. As always, Lord, have your way in this place. In the victorious name of 
Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. We're just going to take a minute as my team gets themselves ready. We're just going to worship. We're going to welcome him in. We're going to sing our songs of praise. We're going to shout for glory. Whatever you need to do this morning before we start. Hallelujah, Jesus, we welcome you in this place. Come and move among us, God. Come and move among us this day. You are welcome here. You're welcome on this stage. You're welcome all the way back to the very back doors of the sanctuary, Lord. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. Come and move, Holy Spirit. We will worship you. We will worship you, one true God.
praise and thanksgiving. Let your presence fill this place. Let your presence fill our praises, Lord, because you're what we want. your presence fill our praise fill our praise come and let your presence fill this place come and let your presence fill our praise fill our praise come and let your presence fill this place come and let your presence fill our praise fill our praise come and let your presence fill
presence fill our praise fill our praise come and let your presence fill this place come and let your presence fill our praise fill our praise come and let your presence fill this place come and let your presence fill our praise fill our praise come and let your presence fill this place come and let your presence fill our praise fill our praise come and let your presence fill this place jesus thank you thank you jesus give you glory today. Choose today whom you will serve. We will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve you, Lord. We just want you, Jesus. We just want to be as close as we can get. God, let your word draw us closer. Let the word of the Lord draw us to your heart. Direct us back to you. To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire No one else will do Cause nothing else could take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace help me find the way bring me back to you
that again. You're all I want. You're all I want, Jesus. You are all. You're all I've ever needed. You're all I want. Help me know you are near. You're all I want. And you're all I've ever needed. first letter, the Apostle John commanded and encouraged the church to love not the world or the things of the world because the love of the world makes us an enemy of God. And then he goes on to define what loving the world is. It's the lust of the eyes what we look at. It's the lust of the flesh, those things that we chase after. And it's the pride of life, the desire to be first among many. Jesus is calling us to let go of those things so that we can draw near to him. I'm mindful that in our world today, Every message that we hear apart from this biblical message, just about every message apart from this biblical message not to love the world calls us to do exactly that, to love the world. And as long as we hold on to the things of the world, we can never draw close to Jesus and he can never draw us closer to him. We are called continually to let go of more and more so that we can have more and more of Him. This morning, we're going to sing this song again. We're going to sing it through. We'll sing the chorus a couple times. We'll start right at the beginning. And if you have something that you need to release, I don't know what it is. We're all working on something different. I have my things that God is calling me away from. They're different than your things. But whatever it is that God is saying, let it go, let it go, let it go, can I just encourage you? Let it go so that you can grow closer to him. We're all working on something. There's not one person in this room that that message doesn't pertain to. I don't need to have you raise a hand and say, oh, is anybody here struggling with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, or the pride of life? Because we all are in one way or another. We've all got something that God's calling on us to let go of, to release. And this morning, can I just encourage you, whatever that is in your life, doesn't matter what it is, you just need to let it go so that you can get a little closer to him this morning. So as we sing this song again, just release that thing. No one can do this work for you. I can't do it. The deacons can't do it. The worship leader can't do it. Only you can do it. But release. Release your fear, release your anxiety, release your worry, release your pride, release whatever. Let him have it. Patrick, lead us out of the song again. To hear you say that I'm your friend, you are my desire, no one else 
Nothing else could take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find a way. Bring me back to you. promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us, that you are with us always, even to the very end of this age, that your presence goes before us and your presence stands behind us, that you are our 
the shield on our right hand and the warrior on our left hand, Lord God, that you are fighting for us in this mighty battle of spiritual warfare that we all fight. Lord, today we hear your call, that your desire is that we grow closer to you. And Lord, we acknowledge all the things that hold us back from drawing close to you. All those things in our lives, whether they be sins or whether they be distractions, Lord God, whatever they are, they hold us back from drawing closer to you. And this morning we repent from them. We lay them down at your feet and we give them to you. And we say to you this morning, Lord God, nothing, 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 nothing is going to hold us back. But we desire to draw closer and closer as you have commanded. Now we ask for your divine help, Lord God, because we know, we know from bitter experience that there is nothing we can do in our, of our own accord, Lord God. Without your strength, we are powerless to defeat any sin or any distraction. We are powerless to put them away except you empower us. And so this morning, God, we lay these distractions, we lay these things at your feet, and we turn to you, and we lift our eyes to the hills. From whence comes our help? Our help comes from the Lord, and we ask you to help us, God, to put aside our every distraction, to put aside our every sin, to put aside everything that entangles us and keeps us from growing closer to you. And we ask you now to let us go deeper, to go further back, and deeper in with you, that we may know you better, that we may know you more. In the mighty name of Jesus, everyone asks it and says, amen and amen. You can be seated. At this point, we want to dismiss our children for Children's Church as we get ready. Yeah. Thank you, wor uh, thank you worship team. Thank you, Kids Church team, for all that you are doing. Amen. All right. While they're doing there, you can. While they're heading out the door, you can turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 19, and uh, we are getting ready to launch into uh, our next sermon in this series. We're going to be finishing up Revelation chapter 19 today, and uh, we are in the home stretch. We're circling the runway, folks. Circle in the runway. We've got five weeks left in this series, and we've got three chapters left to complete. Now, I could, I, I could probably lengthen these chapters out for about two or three months, but we're not going to do that. Um, but we are going to break 50 sermons in this series. Uh, so uh, we are currently uh, in Jesus Doing Life Part 2, Part 46. And we're finishing up uh, Revelation 19 with a sermon subtitled, War No More. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this opportunity that we have to study your word together. Holy Spirit, we recognize that you are the one who brings us into all truth. And so Holy Spirit, we ask you to open our ears today that we might hear what you want us to hear that you will open our minds, Lord God, that we might understand what you want us to understand. Holy Spirit, that you would open our souls and our spirits, that we may grasp hold of what you want us to grasp hold of, decide what you want us to decide, and change what you want us to change. Lord God, let us be challenged by your word as it is held up before us like a mirror. And let us, God, Move in your direction, deeper in, further back. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, so we are in Revelation chapter 19, and we're talking about war no more. Before we do that, I want to just do a bit of a review of sort of where we've been. We're not going to do a comprehensive review. That'll probably be held off from next week. But right now, we're just going to review the last couple of chapters that we've talked about, some of the key concepts that we've been discussing. So we've been talking about this idea of judgment for the last several months. Chapters, Revelation chapter 6 through Revelation chapter 18, 19, part of 20, are really all about the judgment of Christ upon mankind, the earth, and in fact, the whole universe. 
And so we've been talking since we got to Revelation chapter 6, we've really been uh, stuck in this concept of the judgment of God. Make no mistake, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We studied that all during Jesus doing life, part one. But we know that Jesus didn't just come once and that's the end of it. He's coming again. And when he comes again, he will not come as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. He's already done that. He will come as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the judge of all the earth who will do right. And as necessary as it was for him to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, it is just as necessary that he be the judge of all the earth who will do right. We cannot have the completion or the fulfillment of our salvation without both things, the release of salvation and the release of judgment. So we've been talking about judgment over the last several months. And I gave you a, a definition uh, from the Greek of the word judgment a couple of weeks ago. That word is this, krisis. Now that word simply means judgment. But it's a specific kind of judgment. When someone judges something or creases or crinos that judgment, it is about a separation. Jesus, we need to recognize, is separating the whole of his creation from sin. Somebody say amen. amen. That's what judgment is. Judgment is a separation of the creation from sin. Remember, sin is not just bad behavior. It is bad behavior. We have our sins. Lying, cheating, stealing, killing. Those are bad behavior sins. But that's not all sin is. Sin is a power like electricity or thermonuclear energy. Sin is a power that moves through the whole universe. And it has infected the entire universe. Sin is not just the source of bad behavior. Sin is the source of all evil. Sin is the source of all darkness. Sin is the source of all poverty. Sin is the source of all war. Sin is the source of all sickness, weakness, fear, and death. When somebody asks you the question, as I'm sure you've been asked before as a Christian, when somebody asks you, why, how could a God of love allow all this to happen? The answer is simple. God, in order to deal with sin, must judge. And we don't want the judgment to come too early. Because when the judgment on sin comes, Revelation 6 through 20 happens. And so God is not slow as some consider slowness, the apostle says, but he is patient wanting everyone to repent. God is holding back his dealing with sin so that more people can come to know him because once he starts that judgment, there's no turning back. Amen? Because he's not just coming to judge bad behavior. He's not just coming to judge your bad behavior or the guy over there's bad behavior. He's coming to judge all that sin has affected. When Jesus ju judges, he doesn't just declare a thing evil. In other words, he's not gonna come to your life and say, oh, you know that lie you told back to your mother when you were seven, that was bad. That's not judgment. When somebody looks at you and says, you know what, that was not a good thing to do, and you say, don't judge me, that's not judgment. That's telling the truth. When somebody looks at you and says, that, that, you know, that's a sin, don't you dare judge me. How many of you have heard that? You know what? That's not even close to judgment. That's not what we're talking about here when we talk about Jesus judging. Jesus isn't just coming to say, this is good and this is bad. He's already done that. He wrote a whole book about it. <laughs> he's not coming to declare a thing good or evil. And he's not just coming to destroy the things he judges. The book of Revelation is not about the destruction of God, of, of, of all the things that God destroys. It's not God coming into the playroom and blowing up the toy box. 
You see, destruction comes to those things that cannot or will not let go of the power of sin. Why does a thing get destroyed when God judges it? Because it cannot or will not let go of its sin. Because judgment is about the separation of sin from all things. That's what judgment is. Jesus doesn't just separate a thing from sin when he judges. He fixes that thing. Judgment is not just about destruction, and it's not even just about the separation of a thing from sin. Although that's the first step. The second step in judgment is Jesus coming in to fix the brokenness of the thing he judges by removing the sin and then pouring in salvation and honor and glory and power. See, we, we, we look at judgment and say, oh, it's just God blowing things up. That's not all judgment is. Through the book of Revelation, what we see Jesus doing is he is healing that which sin has broken. That's what Jesus is really about. That's what the church is really supposed to be about. We are supposed to be undoing the works of the devil, not just pointing them out, but actually moving in and bringing the healing power of Jesus to the world. Let's talk about a few of the things that we've seen ju Jesus judge in Revelation chapter 6 through 18. In chapter 6, we saw Jesus judge worldly prosperity. We also saw him judge worldly governments and the nations of the earth. In Revelation chapter 8, we saw Jesus judge earth's environment. That's something. Jesus has to judge the environment. Yeah, he has to purify it by fire, the Bible shows us. Revelation chapter 9, we see that Jesus judges unrepentant people, those people who will not give their hearts to him. In Revelation chapter 12, we're going to come back to this one in a minute, but in Revelation chapter 12, we see Jesus judge heaven. What? Watch and see. And then in chapters 16, 17, and 18, we see Jesus judge Mystery Babylon, the world order that rises up against Jesus and his kingdom. But let's go back for just a minute in part, as part of our review and review um, Revelation chapter 12, the judgment of heaven. You may remember that, that, that part of that um, chapter is about the war in heaven. You remember that? We had this whole conversation or this, well, it was kind of one-sided. I told you. I was talking. You were just kind of sitting there saying, amen, or nothing. Um, but we had this whole um, bit about how as we, you know, whenever you believe the rapture is, you know, we all think we go to heaven. And I think this destabilized some of your faith a little bit. I hope it's been built back up since then. But we, depending on when the rapture is, we all go to heaven, and then we all think, oh, you know, I just get my little harp, and I get my little diaper, and I sit on my cloud, and I play my beautiful songs, and that's it. And the truth is, is that's not how heaven works, according to Revelation chapter 12. Because if you believe... For instance, in the rapture coming before the tribulation, well, then you're going up before the, any of the judgment begins. And then when you get to Hebrews chapter, uh, not Hebrews, Revelation chapter 12, guess what happens in heaven where you think you are? War! Now, listen, I don't think we're fighting that war, but what's it like to be a civilian in the middle of a war zone? Not pleasant. Revelation chapter 12 talks about this war in heaven. And I believe also that, and we talked about the need for that, why God has to do that. It's to kick Satan out of heaven once for all. But I believe that this is also the time when we as Christians receive our judgment. What, Pastor Jay? We get judged as Christians? Absolutely. It's not a judgment of heaven or hell. It's a judgment of our works. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. 
Paul the Apostle writes these words. Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation of an expert builder. He's talking about his works on earth. Now others are building on it. In other words, another, other people have come along and they're beginning to build further onto the ministry that I've laid out. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. There's a warning, Paul is saying, don't mess up my churches. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, or wood, hay, and straw. But on the judgment day, that's our judgment day as Christians, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. Now listen, we are all building on the same foundation that the Apostle Paul laid. Every one of us in this room ties ourselves back to the teachings of the Apostle Paul. So you are building on the foundation that the Apostle Paul laid whether you recognize it or not. And all of your work on that judgment day will be gold, silver, precious gems, or wood, hay, and stubble. And the Bible says fire will reveal what kind of work each builder, that would be you, has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But... If the work is burned up, now listen to this, that builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved. But like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. That's a word to us as Christians that we are going to go through a judgment of our works. What are our works going to bring forth on that day? Just a thought that we need to, especially as we live in this day and this age. Now, no one likes to hear about this, but as we live in this day and this age, we need to be mindful of how we are and who we are in the midst of the people that we are building among. So God is going to judge everything. I hope you see that. And the purpose is to separate sin from everything. And to pour in salvation, power, honor, and glory into everything that it might be healed. So let's go on looking at chapter 19 and 20 about this last war. The last uh, two months ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we talked about the four wars of the tribulation. And we're coming to the fourth war now, which is the battle of Armageddon. And so Revelation 19 verse 11 says, I saw heaven standing open. And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. And he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. Who is this? Jesus. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Uh, We had a sister who used to attend here many, many years ago. Her name was Marie Dralius. Some of you may remember her. And I remember she had ALS, and she was getting ready to go and be with Jesus. And she said, Pastor Jay, I want you to know I've, I've applied for the job in heaven of taking care of the white horses. And I'm hoping I get the job. But this army is coming on white horses, and they will be dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty of horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Gross. 
Then I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword, coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Again, ugh. Moving on to chapter 20. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. We're going to talk about the thousand years probably next week. Um, so we won't get too much into that right now. Today we're talking about this war, this War to end all wars. Mankind has said that about a couple of wars already. But this truly is the war to end all wars. Why? Because God, Jesus, is involved in this one. It's important to note that up until now, and maybe you haven't clocked this as we've read through the book of Revelation, and as we've talked about the wars of the book of Revelation and the tribulation, it's important to note that up until now, Jesus... God has not directly participated in any of the wars that have taken place in this book. Not even the war in Revelation chapter 12, the war in heaven. The Bible make, makes no reference to God being involved in that war. It says, Michael and his angels fought against the devil and his angels. This is the first time we see Jesus actually getting involved in any form of warfare. Remember I made this point a couple weeks ago when I said when Jesus releases his judgment, he doesn't go to war with the world. He just pulls back, sends in the riders on the white horse, the black horse, the red horse, and the pale horse, and he sends them in, and they create the condition where mankind wars against itself. The first wars are not wars between God and anybody. They're wars between one faction of mankind and another faction of mankind. The first judgments of God are all mankind destroying himself. But in this war, Jesus is stepping in. So with this war, Jesus comes to Jerusalem to fight against the Antichrist and to judge. Remember, we're talking about judge, judging. Jesus has judged the power of sin. He's judged the governments of the earth. He's judged uh, the financial systems of the earth. He's judged the environment. He's judged mystery Babylon. He's judged heaven. He's judged all these things. Now Jesus is coming to judge Three people and a force in the universe. He's judging the Antichrist, the prophet, the devil, and he's judging war, in the spirit of war in the universe. And he's coming to fight the source of man's warfare spirit, which comes from the Antichrist. Daniel chapter 11, verses 36 through 30, 38, reveals this when it says, the king, Antichrist will do as he pleases, exalting himself and claiming to be greater than every god, even blaspheming the god of gods. He will succeed, but only until the time of wrath is completed. For what has been determined will surely take place. He will have no respect for the gods of his ancestors or for the god that is loved by women or for any other god, for he will boast that he is greater than than all of them. Instead of these, he will worship the God of fortresses, a God his ancestors never knew. So the Antichrist is coming, and he is the spirit of war incarnate. And he, is the, he worships the God of fortresses, the God of warfare. 
Interestingly, it's defensive warfare. Can I just say, the army of Antichrist throughout the book of Revelation is never on the offensive against God. It's always on the defensive. Jesus said these words to the apostle Peter. Thou art Peter, and upon your confession, upon the confession he just made, which Jesus is the Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of hell, the fortress of hell, will not stand against it. Make no mistake, Antichrist has no chance of winning this war. He's never on the offensive against Jesus. Oh, he goes out to battle against Jesus, but he is defending against a superior power, and he knows it. He's just trying to keep the gates of hell closed against Jesus so that Jesus cannot destroy warfare in the world. But with this battle in Revelation chapter 19, with this war, Jesus captures Antichrist, captures the false prophet, and he consigns them to the the lake of fire. And he consigns the devil to the abyss. What's the abyss? The bottomless pit. He doesn't send the devil to hell. He doesn't send the devil to the lake of fire here. He sends him to the bottomless pit. What's a bottomless pit? A bottomless pit. (laughs) Has no bottom. I want you to imagine being thrown into a bottomless pit for a thousand years. What do you do for a thousand years? You fall. Satan is going to fall for a thousand years. He's never going to hit bottom because there's no such thing. That's his punishment for this war. And with this war, Jesus does away with war in mankind. At least for a thousand years. We'll talk about that next week. But Isaiah 2 gives us this passage. Isaiah 2 says this. In the last days, book of Revelation. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They, the nations and the peoples, will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. It's important for us to remember. I'm going to ask Patrick if he'll come back. Where is he? There you are. I'm going to ask Patrick to come, to come back. It's important to recognize, going back to the very beginning, that Jesus' judgment is not just about Jesus destroying things and blowing them up. Jesus' judgment is about the restoration of the world from the power of sin. Jesus will not be content when everything is just destroyed. He will not be content until everything is restored. That is what the book of Revelation is about. It's about revealing the character of Christ and at his heart, Jesus is a healer. Jesus is a creator and he is a healer. He does not revel in the destruction Make no mistake, we people do, but that's because of our fallen nature. But Jesus is trying to heal the world. He's not coming with hatred. I hate this, and I'm going to just blow it up and kill it and destroy it. He's coming to fix it. And one of the things he's attempting to fix, one of the things he's working towards is to end war. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. What does Jesus desire of his people? 
that we would walk with him into the fullness of the restoration. So often the church stops. You can just start playing anytime. So often the church stops short of our bad, with our bad behavior. Right? We're all still working on our bad behavior, right? Is anybody not working on their bad behavior? Because if, if there's anybody here, I'm going to let you preach next week so you can tell us all how you can get to the point where you never have any bad behavior ever again. But so often we make that the focus of our Christianity. Christianity is all about becoming a better person, a better you, a better, you know, getting all the sin out. I'm going to use a different word, but sin it seems more appropriate. He's, and we stop at that. Oh, what's the church about? The church is about stopping, stopping sinful behavior. No, it's not. The church is about the restoration of everything. See, because we're called to be kingdom builders, just like Jesus, to join with our brother Jesus, to join with our joint heir Jesus in restoring the earth from all that the power of sin has broken. So yeah, we've got to continue to work on our bad behavior and get that out. But that's not our, that's not our primary focus. Our primary focus is getting rid of sin in all of its manifestations. That's what we're about. And joining with Jesus in that. How do we do that? By the power of prayer. Prayer is the weapon that God has given to us. Prayer and the Word of God is the we are the weapons that God has given to us. There are no others. Not political influence, not more money, not great programming, not big churches. Prayer. How do we fight this, this, this power called sin? By prayer. Oh, Pastor Jay, we've got to do so much more than pray. Read the scripture. Prayer leads us to certain acts. Prayer will direct us towards certain things. But it all starts with prayer. And if we don't come to the Lord in prayer first, then the things that God wants to establish in the earth will never happen. The church is called to pray. And so today, our focus is war no more. The world right now is at war with itself. There's war in Ukraine. There's war in Israel. There's war in Iran. There's war, war everywhere. The conversation about war is on everyone's lips. But we know the end of the story. We know what Jesus says he is going to do. Our job right now is to pray that into being. Jesus says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. When will the peace of Jerusalem be established? At the end of the tribulation. When will war be done away with? At the end of the tribulation. But Jesus didn't say, well, wait till year number six and a half to start praying about the end of war or for the peace of Jerusalem. When did he say to pray for the pray for the peace of Jerusalem right now when did he say to begin praying for the end of war right now what will that change it will that bring the peace of Jerusalem any closer to us will it change the date when the peace of Jerusalem will be established will it change the date of the battle of Armageddon if we pray today no those dates are set the process is in order. Do you know what prayer changes? You and me. Listen, we all face a temptation today as we hear about wars and rumors of wars. And that temptation is that our love would grow cold and that we would become as warlike as the people around us. But Jesus has not called us to go to war. Jesus has called us to be peace makers. And how do we do that? We pray for peace on the earth. We don't take up a placard. We don't take up a political cause. 
We don't take up a cry against injustice except to the Lord. And then he leads us to the things that we do that will bring peace. Prayer starts it all. And so today, we're going to ask God to establish peace on earth. That's part of the church's work. It's not just to pray for myself, oh God, liberate me from sin, liberate me from sin. Liberate me from my bad behavior. Help me get over my bad behavior. Yeah, that's one of the things we pray for. But we're called to establish the kingdom of God. We are the people who pray for the kingdom of God to be done. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. We are to pray for the wholeness of the kingdom. And so we are called to pray for the end of war. And why? Because our prayers release that. Our prayers alone will release that so that Armageddon ends it, so that Jerusalem can be established. The prayers of the saints now are necessary. The Bible tells us that the prayers of the saints are being stored up in bowls so that they can be poured out in those days. What happens if the saints don't pray? There's nothing in the bowl for God to pour out. We must pray. And what benefit does it give us? It will help us to stand. I don't know about you, but every time I turn on YouTube and there's another call for, to get, get involved in the craziness, my heart does a little uh, And the only way that I have to defend, the only weapon I have to defend against myself going down the primrose path to war myself and becoming a preacher who preaches on one side or to other about how we ought to be doing something. The only way, the only defense I have against that is to pray and pray, God, make me a man of peace. Make me a peacemaker in the midst of this. And that's who we're called to be. So this morning, as Patrick leads us in this song, I'm going to ask everybody to stand. And we're going to pray a prayer for world peace. But I'm going to invite you, if you want to be a peacemaker in the midst of all this craziness that's going on and the, incre the craziness that's going to increase, if you want to be a man or a woman of peacemaking in the middle of all this, then come to these altars and begin to pour out your heart and say, God, make me a peacemaker. Do whatever you have, shift whatever you have to, shift whatever attitude you have to in my heart to make me a person of peace. If that's a prayer that you can join in on, then I'm going to invite you to these altars now. Patrick, lead us out. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I, I speak, speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus, cause your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life, break every stronghold, shine through the shadows. I speak Jesus. Oh, I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxieties. To every soul held captive by depression.
for my family I speak a holy name Jesus we speak your name Lord shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy Your name is power. Your name is freedom. Your name is light. We recognize that today. Lord Jesus, we come to you and we openly confess that we are poor in spirit and we desperately need the movement of your Holy Spirit in our daily lives. So we call to you, Jesus, help us. Help us and fill us with your love. Fill us with your light. Fill us with your freedom. Fill us with your power, God. Because without that, we have nothing. Lord, you said that if we sought you in this way, that you would pour the kingdom of God into our hearts. 
God. We mourn over the condition of the world today, Lord God. We recognize that we are in the days of wars and rumors of wars. We are in the days of ever-increasing poverty, and our hearts mourn, Lord God. Lord, for those of us who struggle with this mourning, for those of us whose hearts are even on the brink of hardening, because we can't take what we're seeing anymore. I ask that the love of Jesus would be poured afresh into every one of our hearts, that they might become tender again. God, we pray that you help us to realize that we are not the answer here, but you are. So Jesus, let us come to this place of prayer continually, recognizing that only as we pray you forth will the need be met. But when we pray, God, when we pray, those prayers will move mountains. So make us people of humility and prayer. God, we pray that you would make us those who hunger and thirst for justice and righteousness, that you may establish it. Today we come to you and we pray for an end of war. We pray for an end of poverty. We pray for an end of sickness. We pray for an end of darkness, knowing, Lord God, that these are promises you have made. Bring it to the land, Jesus. Bring it to the world, Jesus. Do what is necessary, God. We pray, Lord God, that you would bring the peace of your city, Jerusalem, to the earth. We pray, Lord God, that you would bring an end to war and you would bring that day. You would bring that day, Lord God, when all nations will beat their swords into plowshares. Bring it because we pray that you would bring it because you've commanded us to pray it. Knowing that our prayers are filling up the bowls of judgment that are going to be poured forth, that the healing from the spirit of war may take place. Jesus, we pray that as we are waiting, you would help us to be patient, to continue to speak the name of Jesus over this world, to be people of prayer and patient endurance. Lord, help us to work for peace so that we might be called the children of God, even if that causes people to turn against us, Lord God, because we won't take up one cause or another. Help us, Lord Jesus, to continue to be peacemakers. Help us, Lord, not to consider that our job is done when we've given some money or gift to a charitable organization but cause us to share and truly care for one another, especially as the days get darker and harder. Lord, let Cornerstone Church be a place that embodies the values of sharing and caring with our world, the world about us. Help us to truly do life together, not just with our little group, but to meet needs in the church body and the community at large. Help us, Lord God, to build spiritual relationships as we reach out and help us to live with open hands. Help us not just to give our money, but help us to give our hearts. Help us to be willing to let people in. Lord, we know, we know what your word says, that days of great difficulty, a great storm is on the horizon. Lord, let your church be an answer in the midst of the storm. We know we can't stop the storm from coming, but we can continue to be an answer of provision and hope in the midst of the storm. Lord, whatever you would call us to do, Help us to remember love, warmth, kindness, hope, purpose, and help us to pour those things out on those who are in need of them. 
above all, Lord, as the storm increases, help us to remember that the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run to it, and they are safe. Help us to continually be the people who run into the presence of the Lord. Help us to run into fellowship with the body. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more, even as we see this day approaching. Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem to be established. We pray for the peace of the kingdom of God to be established. And we pray that that thing would be established in our heart first today. Lord, it may be some time before it's actually manifested on the earth, but it can be manifested in our hearts today. And so let the peace, the peace of God, cover us today and fill us today to overflow. I pray this over this congregation and I release the peace of God that passes all understanding, the peace of God that doesn't make sense into our lives right now. And I thank you, Lord God, for all that you are doing. In the mighty name of Jesus, now I pray a blessing on brothers and sisters as they go their way into the world. Let this peace not fly away come Monday morning, but let it be established permanently in our hearts. Let us walk in it and live in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Be at peace.